So if you've been following the channel for a while, and you've seen any of my videos before, it's probably no surprise that I have a new laser sitting here, and I'm about to do a new review. This laser is a 20 watt class one diode laser from a new company called Gloofy. In fact, I think that's how you say the name. I'm not even entirely sure, but based on the spelling, I, I think that's, that's right. Now, I wanna do this one a little bit differently because this laser is a little bit different. Based on my agreement with the company, I have a long list of things I'm supposed to say about the laser, which I will. And then I'm gonna go into my actual review of the machine, my actual thoughts on the machine, because I think they're needed even more so in this case. The laser is interesting, a little bit strange at times, a little bit quirky, and I wanna make sure that I, as honestly as I can, kind of represent all those things with this machine so that you can decide whether or not this is the right model for your shop. And for some of you, it might be. And for others, maybe not. But let's go ahead and get into it. The laser was packed really well. In fact, it's kind of like an expectation at this point, given how many lasers are on the market and how many examples that they would have already been able to see before putting out their own product. And because it's a self-contained unit, all the accessories were safely nestled inside. We have the adapter for the hose, some various tools and Allen wrenches, power adapter, and of course, more foam. Under that is where we actually have our exhaust hose, our air pump, and we also have our star of the show, which is the laser. The laser looks very reminiscent to some other 20 watt lasers I've seen other companies use. There's a small little viewing window there with red plexi to kind of protect you from the laser rays and built in on the machine is autofocus. And under that final piece of foam, we have our honeycomb tray, and we're finally able to free up our gantry and start getting things put together. The assembly of the machine was pretty simple. It just took a couple screws to mount the laser head onto the gantry, although the instructions are really sparse for how this thing goes together. So if there's anybody that is buying this machine that doesn't have a whole lot of experience, they might have a little bit of trouble with it. And the one unique thing about this that I noticed was that when you're mounting the laser head onto the gantry, there is one thumb screw. And that thumb screw and the placement of it are really important because that thumb screw is what actually triggers the limit switch as it goes up and down. Other than that, assembly is maybe 15, 20 minutes, and then you're pretty much ready to go as far as the machine assembly goes. There is some additional setup needed in Lightburn, but that's mainly for setting up the autofocus, which is right there on the laser head, which is really nice, and also for an additional two millimeter offset when cutting. So Gloofy has a couple different statements they actually would like me to make, and I'm gonna read some of those verbatim here. So one is their mission statement is that they want enclosed lasers for all DIY engravers. And that goes along with their mission of also making something that is safe and reliable to use. And safety appears to be one of the priorities for Gloofy in their machine. Um, it has several fire sensors in it. It's enclosed with the purpose of not letting any of the light rays out. Gloofy is also trying to put the DIY experience and the quality of the product ahead of profits. And the machine is competitively priced. So now that they got some of that out of the way, I think we should turn on the machine and start running some test engraves. Before I could do that, there's a little bit of extra setup needed in Lightburn before we could use the machine. And that really comes down to setting up the autofocus and a couple other small features. There's documentation that comes with the laser and how to do that. So I'm not really gonna cover that much here. I'm also not gonna be going over much of the operation in Lightburn since Lightburn is almost a separate entity in and of itself. I might as well comment on that right now. This machine compared to a lot of other modern machines right now does not have its own independent specialized software, which is good in a lot of ways. And it operates off of Lightburn or Laser Gerbil. And just as a reminder, Lightburn is a paid piece of software. I believe it's $60 for the license. The license is perpetual. And I really love Lightburn. Or you can use Laser Gerbil, which is free in order to operate the machine. Um, it has a lot of the basic features, but Lightburn really is the full-fledged the full suite software that you want if you're using diode lasers. Um, so I'm glad they actually went that route with this. Let's go ahead and do our first initial engraves and cutting. So I ran several engraving tests and they came out pretty good. Now, I don't want to be overly ambivalent about the engraving, but at this point, anybody that's putting out a laser 
at a certain wattage should be able to produce a pretty nice engrave. There's a couple factors that I want to remind you that you have to take into account. One is the quality of the image, the setup of the engrave. But if those things are taken care of, you should get a pretty good result every time, unless there's something really fundamentally wrong with the laser itself. Most of these images I do as a standard, starting at about 200 DPI. I have various power settings just to see how dark we can get and the quality of the image on the wood. And I would call these satisfactory. I don't necessarily think that they are the best I've ever seen, but I think they're acceptable under these circumstances without really trying to tune further. Speaking of engraved tests, I also did a grid test looking at the range of lights to darks for the laser itself. According to Glufi's material, this should top out about 24,000 millimeters a minute, which comes out to about 600 uh, millimeters a second for speed. And I don't always go to 100% for the engraved test because I'll probably catch on fire. And I had quite a few fire sensor alarms when I was trying to do these tests. So this is like my fourth iteration of trying to do this. Probably a lot more intervals than I need, but I like seeing that gradation, making sure that I can get those values and those different darks that I want for my engraves. And I also did a cut test. Once again, this will be set up in light burn. And I think my optimal cutting is going to be about 600 millimeters a minute and about 85 power. So you don't have to run at the full 100% power. You can cut at a little bit of a lower power there as well. It cuts and engraves. I also did a larger cutout of a side of a castle. It was supposed to have a mating side, which I was not able to get to cut. And I'll talk about that in a few moments. That concludes the testing that I did in terms of engraving or cutting. And that's mainly because I know what a 20 watt dial laser is capable of. Now, for all of you that aren't aware of, a 20 watt dial laser should be able to cut three millimeter stock, meaning uh, MDF and plywood fairly well. It can cut opaque acrylics but it cannot engrave or cut clear ones. And that's not a limitation of Glufi's machine. That's a limitation of diodes in and of themselves. So it's a 20 watt laser. It'll do all the standard things. It'll engrave, it'll cut, everything that the documentation always says with diode lasers. Um, and if you don't know what that is, check the description below. I'll list a lot of those things there, or I'll put a link to what they could typically do. I'm not gonna go through that here. I've already done it so many times in other videos before. I wanna focus a little bit more on the machine itself and what we have here from this company because that's kind of why I chose to do the video is to show what is different about it, what is good, and so that you can make an informed decision about whether or not this is the machine that you want. Um, otherwise, you're really deciding between whether you want a diode or a CO2 or a fiber laser, which is a different decision and kind of consideration altogether. So let's kind of dive in. Let me show you some things in the machine that I think are good, um, maybe even cool, and also what are a little bit strange. So let's get into my review. So this machine, like I've already stated several times before, is a enclosed class one diode laser. It has the green laser glass on top that when closes, should keep everything nice, secure, and safe. One thing that I don't like is that there's no system other than gravity to keep the lid down. It would be nice if there was a light magnet or something. And by light, I meant like lightweight to help keep it closed. Because ever so slightly, there's a little bit of pop-up. But as I've been using the laser, I have not seen any light leak at all. I haven't felt any issues as far as that goes. But right now, it's depending on the weight of the lid and gravity, to hold it down. Now, it should stay flat. The glass itself is about an eighth of an inch thick and it has some nice foam insulation over the side that is fairly dense. But I thought these are magnets, but I don't know what these are, but they don't seem to make contact with anything. So that would have been something that would have been nice. So something else about this machine is that it is a plastic injection molded case. That's it. There's no metal. It's all plastic. Now there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. It's just a detail that I'm mentioning because other machines have either aluminum or steel siding 
and some people prefer that over other things. And just after about, I don't know, five hours or so that I have into this machine, you can see how the smoke sticks to everything. All that soot from engraving and cutting. Which also means that the fan, the internal fan that we have here, probably is not strong enough by itself. Once again, not a big deal. That's the case for a lot of lasers. You might want to consider an inline fan going um, to pull to better pull out the uh, fumes. Now this right here is the filter that Gluffy mentions in the documentation that's supposed to capture quite a bit of the smoke and it does do some of it and also does a lot in dampening sound. So the sound from the fan is dampened strangely enough by this. So it's kind of like a foam insulation wrapped here with this little honeycomb material but then we also have this filter on the other side. Now I only have about six hours into this and you can see how that looks. That's how much is captured already in terms of the soot. Which there's no documentation on how long this is supposed to last. And there's no information on their site about buying new ones and replacing it. What I also know is that when this gets filled up, it's also going to put more pressure on the fan trying to exhaust. So I'm not sure how efficient this is in the long run because of that. And it might be too early on with the company for them to address it. So I'm not really sure. But there it is. The gantry right here, I have it turned right now because I had it in rotary mode with their rotary engraver, which I'll be showing off in a moment. Let's take a quicker look at their honeycomb tray, which I'm glad they include. There's nothing essentially wrong with this. I just kind of want to point it out. It is a smaller form factor. It's actually fairly thin in comparison to others, which once again, it's fine. Um, and it's kind of a, a soft, softer mesh in here. No issues, just kind of pointing it out. And then we have our thin piece of steel there at the bottom that's protecting it from the plastic case at the bottom. It is a very, very thin piece of metal that's there on the bottom. I guess at some point we could flip it over if we want. You could already see some of the staining from all of the uh, cutting and engraving I've been doing. And you can even see the pattern of the honeycomb there uh, coming through. Um, I should probably clean that off before I do any other engraves, but just kind of want to show that. And also the bottom of the case is just pure plastic. So it would have been nice if there's a more permanent integration of the metal into the bottom like I've seen in other lasers. But once again, they are trying to keep costs down. And this is the solution they've come up with for their system. Not wrong. Just pointing out their choice in this one specific matter. Now, something I do like is that there is a plastic molded area for this to sit in and it's not going to slide around. So this is molded to this specification along with a gantry so you know that everything should kind of sit flat and square especially when it comes to the honeycomb it slides right in or drops right in rather and doesn't move around it's locked in place we have a guide there with our measurements they could be helpful as well i hope this becomes standard on a lot of honeycombs it's not always but there it is Let's talk about the rotary. The gantry itself rotates. So you have three mounting screws, you take those out and then you flip the entire thing and the laser sits this way. And the rotary sits in the back and then it engraves. And it actually worked pretty well. It might be one of the better features of this machine. And the engraving came out pretty good. As long as you have your settings correct in light burn, and you have everything framed up correctly, it should come out pretty good. You do need to make sure you register how many steps it takes for the rotary to rotate. But that's something typical with any rotary with using light burn. It's nothing specific to Gloofy. And I'm, I kind of like their setup. It is a little bit awkward, but I can see myself leaving this machine in this format for doing rotary work. And the rotary itself is really different and interesting. I've never seen this model before. Um, I'm going to assume that 
Gloofy did not make this. This is actually bought from a supplier that makes these. And this particular version has the rotating headstock. It looks a little bit more industrial too in terms of the material. This is not that plastic coated jaw, although it only came with these jaws. You can take these out and put other things there, but these came with it pretty much in one piece like this. And there is a tailstock that came with this as well. So pretty industrial feeling rotary. I think this came from somewhere else, but it's been adapted and will work in this machine. So I'm kind of on board with this. So a couple other notes about this machine. I have it back in the regular configuration here with the typical setup for the gantry. I mentioned before that all the cables are nicely tied up. Um, and there's not that many of them. We have our air hose, we have power, and then we have additional cables here for the motor. And one issue with this in this format is that the wires sit a little bit proud of the case. I had to bend the top of the power connector over quite a bit for the lid to actually close. I think that might be by design. It's also why they have this reinforced the tape right there, which is fine, I guess. The one issue I have with this though, has to do with as it goes back and seeing what happens there. There needs to be a clip or some sort of retention that holds those down to make sure that it slides under. And it barely hits the limit switch there. And that puts a lot of pressure on the wires and the motor. So I think you're losing a little bit of work area there because the actual limit should be right there. That should be the limit. And with the cords better tucked. I've been able to use it and the cords did go under without too much of an issue, but you can tell the, the pressure, you even hear the limit switch. at that point. So it gets a little bit tight. Probably my biggest dislike of the machine is, is this here. Two more quick things. The exhaust hose and the exhaust port is pretty much what you expect, except when you look underneath. The cutout from the machine itself is not the entire space of the hose. And I'm gonna assume that that's not a good thing because it puts more pressure on the fan and gives less surface area to evacuate the smoke from. I don't know why they didn't just make that bigger and make it the entire scope of, of this, but I would see that as a design flaw. I could be wrong. If there is an actual reason why, that that would not take up the entire surface or area of the exhaust port, let me know. I am more than willing to kind of make a retraction on that, but it seems a little bit weird. Back here are the fire sensors, and they were triggered way too easy. I'm not exactly sure why. And I don't know if it's a light burn setting or if it's something with the machine. I actually think it's the sensitivity of this that has to be fixed and adjusted. And I, and it took me a long time to do the testing that I had to do because this kept getting tripped, and it shouldn't have. I had the air assist on, and the fan was running, evacuating the smoke. There was no flame, I was doing a simple cut, and it kept kicking off. So I got really familiar with the button right there and restarting things in light burn. And this is what I was trying to cut. So I got this one cut out and it cut beautifully. It was actually a really nice cut, especially based on the test, uh, especially based on the testing that I did with the uh, grid test but I just could not get through the mating piece. It would go, get up to about right there, and then it would stop, the alarm would sound. There is a lack of documentation on how to fix this and how to overcome this. This was not overburning. there was no flame. In fact, you can see the back side, and it, there's no, not even any flashing. So I'm not really sure what that was. And that made it really difficult to use the machine. Now, I think that might be a small modification or small adjustment, 
But other than that, everything actually worked pretty well. And the machine did exactly what it was supposed to do. So let's wrap this up. And this part is a little bit tough. Uh, let me first start by saying that this is not really a paid endorsement. The company provided me with the laser and the rotary for review, but there's been no direct payment to make this video for them. Um, although the video is at their request. There's also no commission structure in place for any laser units that might be sold as a result of this video. So I received the laser, I received the rotary, but there's been no talks of any other payment of any kind. So everything I'm gonna say here is of my own opinion and not directly influenced by the company um, at all. Um, I need to first say that I don't know who would actually wanna start a laser company in 2024 given the competition that's out there. I know that we create is a brand new company and they came out with a fairly successful laser and I think that they are an exception. It's gotta be a really hard thing to do. There's some stiff competition out there and the technology has come a long way. I admire what Gloofy is trying to do by lowering the bar for entry in terms of getting a machine and making it somewhat easy for somebody to use. But there is still a little ways to go for that to actually happen, especially when you're depending on Lightburn, which is not an easy piece of software, although it is the best and the right piece of software to actually get going with the laser. The price, on the other hand, is competitive, but it's also tough because it is a competitive market price-wise. There's three models of this laser available, 5 watt, 10 watt, and 20 watt. And the pricing as of right now, it's about 599 for the 5 watt, 999 for the 10 watt, and this model right here is running about 1299, not including the laser, although it does come with a honeycomb tray and it does come with the air pump. And you don't need anything extra to use a rotary with this machine. So you do save a little bit there. And I think that's where some of the competitive pricing comes in. The internal size of the machine is decent and acceptable for general use. It's not the largest I've seen, but you're always gonna be limited by the form factor that you're trying to get into people's shops. So I don't really fault them for that either. It is a decent machine. My only hang up about the machine has to do with the flame detection and the fact that I was not able to complete the simple cuts that I really needed to do. But I'm also gonna guess that it's a simple adjustment of a sensitivity level that has to be changed, but they didn't provide documentation for that, even though I think I might know how to handle it. But they need to fix their documentation, especially if they want to roll this out to a larger audience. So. Whether or not I would recommend getting this, um, I wouldn't recommend not getting it, but make sure you do your homework and look at all the other options out there. If you like the form factor, if you like what it's able to do, um, then you might want to give it a look. Um, otherwise, it's like always, always up to you. This video is for all of you to make an informed decision. This video really is not for the company. And because you've taken your time to watch this video and hopefully take into consideration what I'm saying, I wanna make sure I'm giving you the honest assessment because some of those things could easily be improved and then of course it becomes a, a more viable candidate for um, a lot of you. And if I get that information, if I see that it changes, then I'll make sure to let everybody know um, in one way or the other. That is my assessment of the machine. If you made it this far of the video, I really want to thank you for making it this far. I know it is a long video, but there was a lot to say and a lot to cover. If you'd like to see more of my content, I have a lot of videos in the back catalog that cover a wide variety of topics, not just laser reviews or laser projects, but also some DIY products that I promise I'll be getting back to soon. Um, <laughs> I never intended for this to become a laser review channel, and I'm actually going to be tapering that down and probably cutting that off almost completely in the near future, but this one kind of slipped in along with one or two others that I have coming. So if you want to see more things from me and from Geek Builders, go ahead and check out geekbuilders.net. I have a shop there with different DIY items and different things for you to kind of explore. And also on Patreon, we have a pretty good group on there right now. I have digital plans for sale and also different designs that you can uh, download for free if you're one of the paid members. So make sure to check that out. In the meantime, don't forget to design, make, and play, and hopefully I'll see you in the next video. Take care.